This is the Education Show. Unlocking opportunities in teaching and learning through collaboration. Proudly brought to you by Zabuza.net. And once more, it is another episode and edition of the Education Show. Today we're talking uh, resilience and we're talking what grit is. Uh, but before we get into all of that, let me introduce you to my guest for today. Uh, she is the founder of Grit Growing Resilience Within and her name is Candice Bester. Hello, Candice. Hi, David. How are you? I am exceptionally well, thank you. Always good when I get to do this. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy what I do. Now, before we dive into what growing resilience within is all about, tell me a little bit about yourself, Candice. I am a mom of three children. I have three of my own children, and I was a teacher who taught in the classroom for 18 years. Um, my passion has always been to drive change. Um, I've had a deep, deep calling. And I think at the age of two, I already knew I was going to be a teacher. My mom has photos of me literally as a baby holding other babies. <laughs> so it's very much about who I am. Um, I grew up in a family of teachers, actually. My mom's a teacher. My mom's sisters are all teachers. So there was really, really no getting out of it. Um, yeah, that's basically me. I have a, a very, very deep passion to make a difference in the world. And children are just my happy space. Wonderful stuff. Well, I'm glad they are because if you've got three of them I've, over the last little while, having them at home, it must have been uh, interesting. Um, but now, Candice, you, you say that was what you always wanted to do. You always wanted to, do, to work with children. You were a teacher. Um, and then something came along called grit, growing resilience within. Now, talk to me about why did you change and what is grit? Okay. So, David, if I can explain to you, um, I started to notice a pattern in my own teaching in my classroom. The teachers from the year before would often put what I put in inverted commas as their difficult children um, in my class. And they would come see me from about the September already and they'd say to me, I'm going to put this child in your class because I really think that they're best suited for you. And then very ironically, by the end, by the middle of the next year, um, the teachers would say to me of my grade, they would say, how is it possible that you always get the good class? And I would have to chuckle to myself because there was obviously something that I was doing very differently if I was able to turn the situation around that everybody was looking at me and going, why, 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 what is different? Um, and then what I noticed was I was really equipping the children as opposed to, to sorting out their stuff for them. Um, and I was giving them really huge life skills that they were implementing um, and that was, was making a big difference. Um, things like we would have a fun day and all the teachers would be sorting things out for their kids. They would be running to the teachers with every little thing, a saw on their, on their, um, on their knee, um, so-and-so pushed them. And I would sit there with, with, with no children running to me. It was a little bit of an ego thing because I thought nobody needed me. But ultimately, I realized that I really had done something to equip these children. Um, and then the calling came from I felt like I wanted and I needed to just get this out there that the teachers could learn the, these skills, but ultimately that they could teach it to the children too. Okay, now when you when you talk about these skills, Candice, what sort of skills are we talking about? I mean, you know, traditionally we pack our children up and send them off to school and they do the dreaded book learning and then the teachers pack them up and trundle them back to us in the afternoon. So so what is different? What did you do? So if if I can give you a few examples to, to really land um, the whole idea. So it's very much life skills that I actually only learned as an adult that I wish, wish, wish I had learned. And I think my life would have been very different. And it really is a different, it's a big shift in perspective. So in the moments of something happening, it's, it really is about showing them and teaching them what they're looking at and how to deal with the situation. But let me give you an example. So two children would come up to me, and this is a very real problem I need to tell you as a grade one teacher. Two children would come up to me and the one child would say to me, he called me stupid. So if you're a good teacher, you would turn to the child and say, my darling, you know, I really need you to use your words carefully. I need you to think about things because when you say things, you can't take them back and you're going to upset people and you're going to hurt their feelings. 
a teacher who has had enough of the child who is always calling all the other children names is going to maybe punish them or say, I've just had enough, I can't deal with this anymore. But I would do something completely different. I wouldn't even give a second thought to the, what I call the perpetrator. And I would turn to the child who's got the issue and say, what did he call you? And then she'd go, or he'd go, he called me stupid. And then I'd say, but is that true? And then they start thinking. And then I would find some way to prove that whatever they've just been told is not true. So I'd say, quickly fetch your maths book. So they'd run their fetch your maths book. I'd find a really good page in the maths book. And I'd say, well, does this look like a child who is stupid? And the biggest smile on their face and they're shaking their head. And in that moment, that child has learned that forever people can say things to you, but you don't need to believe them. You don't need to take those things on. And at the same time, the other child is looking at this thinking, oh, maybe I should think about it before I say it, because actually it really isn't that true. Okay, well, that makes a, a huge amount of sense to me. And, and you, as you rightly said, I kind of wish that was the sort of thing I was uh, taught when I was a youngster and growing up, because that even to this day is one of my triggers. If somebody tells me I'm stupid, I fly into a rage immediately. Um, and, you know, that, that going back to those days, maybe that could have been changed. So resilience, okay, you've given me, you've given me one example there. So Give me some other ideas of what this is, because it's not as simple as going, you're not stupid. There's, there's a whole lot involved here. And if I understand correctly, just from having a look at what I did, it's essentially, as you say, these life skills of how to deal with issues. Um, and, and now that we're all big and grown up, um, I believe we call it emotional intelligence these days. Absolutely. That is, that is the word that we use, um, David. It is. So if I can give you a few more examples, um, I really showed my children again with, with proper examples. Cause you know, my belief is you can tell a child something until that you are blue in the face, but nothing is going to shift until you make it this, until there's really raw evidence to prove that the stuff works and until they actually take it on for themselves and they see that it benefits them only then are they really going to believe what you say because let's be honest how many lessons have we taught in the past where we tell kids to be kind to use their words carefully to think about um, their actions to make good choices and then we're still sitting with children who are just repeating the same behaviors so one of the things that was very, um, was in, inside my classrooms, and I, I, I just love this example. Um, I always used to teach them that when something is really difficult, instead of seeing it as the biggest challenge and that it's difficult, they need to ask themselves, what am I learning? Because whenever anything as an adult, I only learned this like probably in the last two years, Whenever anything was really difficult for me, it really meant that there was something that I wasn't seeing or there was something that I needed to learn. So the one day I still remember this gorgeous little girl's face, again, grade one, all my examples are from there. I spent most of my 18 years in grade one. Um, she had her hand up to answer a question and I didn't get to her, so she put her hand down. And then she was excited and she put her hand up again and I didn't get to her. And after the third or fourth time of me asking somebody else, she put her hand down. She had the biggest smile on her face. And she said, right now, I am learning patience. <laughs> 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 yeah, and I was just like, wow, if that wasn't just an absolute testament of a normal child in that situation could so go, my teacher doesn't like me. She never chooses me. What I don't, what I say doesn't have any like relevance. Why me? Why me? Poor me, victim. And it was just a total shift in perspective. Which is wonderful. I mean, <laughs> mm. <laughs> I could have done with some learning patience when I was younger as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. Where were you um, when I was in school? So, so then, <laughs> You notice these things, and, and number one, hats off to you for being a grade one teacher and, and managing that <laughs> for 18 years. Um, and then you still went ahead and had kids of your own. This is, this is amazing to me. <laughs> but when did you get to the point where you were like, okay, well, this is a thing, and I need to do more of this and, and sort of formalize it? You know, it's so funny. I would say that it was uh, like, I call it the universe. Some people call it God. Um, some, whatever you believe in, my higher being, my higher power. It was a very deep gut-wrenching 
call from within that literally the one day I'll never forget, I was sitting behind my laptop and I said, tomorrow I have to resign. <laughs> and when I resigned, I just almost, and this is the, the advice that I give to anybody that if you know in your gut that you have a bigger calling, if it is something that is of divine intervention, the calling is so loud and so apparent that you, you can't ignore it. Then you need to take that big leap of faith. And once you've taken that leap of faith, you absolutely have to put on what I call a bulletproof vest because you are going to have everybody telling you you've done the wrong thing, you're crazy, and then your self-doubt kicks in. And that's when you go and you withdraw your resignation. Or you take a step back and you go, oh, I don't have what it takes. Um, and then what is what is on offer is you're going to miss out on living your absolute dream life. So I put a bulletproof vest on. And the funniest thing is, is the people closest to me were the ones that that were the, the biggest influence in, in not pushing me to do my calling, but they really thought I had made the biggest mistake. I remember taking phone calls from siblings and, Literally, I had to, to, to shift my mind and not listen to what they were saying because if I had taken in even one of the things that they were trying, well, that they were planting, not that they were trying to do, but that, that, that was coming in, I would never have done what I did. So that's a big, big thing for me is I just literally decided to, to resign and I just took a leap of faith and I just, you know, I mean, it hasn't been easy but I just trusted, 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 trusted. And then when you've taken that big leap of faith, the rewards just start flooding in. And that's how you know you've made the right decision because it was actually way easier than what I thought. That's wonderful. Now, how long have you been, have you been doing uh, and, and running Grit Grow? <laughs> so um, I left teaching in December of last year uh -huh. and I've been doing this since January. <laughs> oh, okay. So you, you, you literally, in terms of what most people would say, pick the worst time to resign. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> now, now, I mean, I've had a look at your, at your website and everything, and it seems like you definitely have your ducks in a row. But now we still live in these COVID times. Um, how do you work then, uh, Candice? Yes. Do you go into schools? Do you do individual coaching and training up? Give me an idea of, of how your business runs. So um, initially we wanted to, like my vision was to go into the classrooms and be doing this with the children. And then I soon realized that because of COVID that wasn't feasible. So with regards to the children, we run really amazing, powerful online um, workshops. So it's basically four modules. Um, they, they log on for one hour a week for four weeks in a row. And one week after the next, the entire perspective shifts that by the end of the four weeks, um, if, I see the test, if I show you the testimonials of the parents, um, it's just again testament to the, the fact of how quickly this stuff um, actually works. For example, kids that have never been able to make friends have suddenly made three friends out of nowhere. Um, children who have been bullied are standing up for themselves. Um, and the funny thing is, is our workshops aren't about bullying. Our workshops are not about bullying. They're about inner strength, believing in yourself. And when you get to believe in yourself and when you know what you have to offer and when you know your worth, all the stuff on the outside just disappears as if by some kind of a magic. So those are our online workshops. Um, and then with regards to the teacher training, we just keep it to smaller groups. So there'll be like 20 teachers in a group and we just adhere, adhere to our social distancing and our masks and our sanitizing and all that kind of thing. But I don't, I really do still prefer to do it in person if, if I have a choice. Okay. Yeah, I suppose that, that's understandable. Now, you touched on something very important there is the teachers as well, because to my mind, it's all good and well showing the children how to do it. But in mm. terms of being effective, uh, mm. teachers could learn this as well. Mm. And uh, the more teachers that you have that are out there um, giving these kind of lessons, uh, mm. the better, I would say, for our, for our young people. Talk to me a bit about the, the teacher side of it. So, um, David, it is so, so magically transformational 
how this program works. It is really not content based. So how our tra teacher training works is, again, we come in once a week, but this time it's for two hours a week for four weeks. And we instill something within the teachers that they literally immediately go and implement into their own personal life. It has nothing to do with the kids. It all has to do with their own emotional intelligence. So it's, they're doing their own work on themselves, um, on their beliefs, on their triggers, on their self-worth, on it's all on themselves. And because they're working on themselves, they start to see things very differently. And again, they show up um, in the classroom as a very different teacher. Um, the one thing that I did realize was, as a teacher, if I walked into the classroom and I was not okay emotionally, my children would not be okay emotionally. They would pick up on my energy and I would blame them for my bad day. So I would go, I cannot believe how impossible my children are today. How is it possible that five of them have done this? Until I actually realize, no, Candace, it's not that at all. You are not emotionally okay. So I would start to do my work on myself. And the more work I did on myself, the more I would, would show up in the classroom. Literally, the kids, there was no issue. That's the thing that's so mind-blowing. There is no issue with the children. There's no issue other than the issue we make up. If we just sort out our own stuff, it really is just a different shift in perspective. It's so interesting that you say this because I remember back many years ago when I was in school, my English teacher, when I was in standard nine and matric, we still had standards in those days. Um, <laughs> She always used to say that, that she firmly believed there was no such thing as a bad student, but only a bad mm -hmm. teacher. And I think bad teacher is probably a bit of a strong word, but a mm -hmm. teacher that, that wasn't showing up. Now, mm -hmm. this is something, and we've talked about it on the show before, where, you know, teachers, we put them under tremendous pressure. As I said earlier, mm -hmm. we pack our children off in the morning and we just expect these poor teachers to survive and let something go wrong with little Johnny and we're very quick to jump on the teachers about it. But teachers have been undergoing tremendous stress even before COVID. It's worse now. Does this program help address that issue as well? You know, David, the teachers, teachers by nature are people pleasers. Teachers by nature want to do the right thing. They are citizens of the law and they are very hard on themselves. So they don't want to do anything other than the right thing, but they do not have this emotional support to be coping. I mean, I was a teacher during lockdown. If you know what is thrown at the teachers, I mean, as you say, it is just insane, but by some miracle, they just keep swimming and they just keep swimming. And then we go online and then we go offline and then we go hybrid, which is you've got some kids in your class and you need to be online at the same time. And guess what? You just keep learning skills and you just keep showing up. And your marking goes from 30 activities a day to 250 activities a day. And suddenly you're working until one in the morning and you show up and you lose your cool and suddenly somebody's saying, you know what? You need to be calm. They've never, ever, well, when I say never, they lack the emotional support and they don't have the tools to be able to cope, but yet we just expect them to. I don't, that was a big reason for me doing, for, for me doing this program because with the Grit Growing Resilience Within program, we teach the teachers specific tools. When you are feeling like this, it is because of this and this is what you need to do. And when you're supporting yourself emotionally, it's all about your own support. Then you show up as a different teacher. Well, I think this is this is brilliant. I mean, this is exactly what we've been talking around for, for quite a while now is, is how best to support our teachers so that they can support um, our kids and our learners as well. Now, who do you do this for, Candice? Is this just for, for the littlies? And because as I'm sitting here thinking, I'm thinking, heck, I know some moms and dads that could do with this. Yes. So another big passion and a lot of the work that I do is actually with parents. Um, I'm quite, so I do, I've got quite a lot to do with a group called um, Aware Parenting. But if I can name it my own thing, it's called Conscious Parenting. 
And um, again, very much like as a teacher, I have done things very, very differently with my three children compared to how I was raised as a, as a, as a child um, and how the majority of our generation were raised. Literally, it's almost as if I was a rebellious teenager and I was going against everything I'd ever been taught about parenting. So at the age when my eldest son, who's now 13, was three years old, um, I had a conversation with my husband at the time and I said to him, I want to take away every, every ounce of consequences. I don't want to punish the children. At that stage, we were still actually giving hidings. So my, my child at the age of three, we stopped punishing and we stopped completely giving consequences. And as I say this to people, you literally see their entire face change and their whole body language changes. And then I wait for the next words that are going to come out of their mouth, which is generally, I will not have my child rule the roost. I will not have my child be a rebellious little brat. So that is absolutely not the way that I will raise them. But the most delusional illusion of the whole thing is every time somebody meets my children they say to me what have you done so differently they are polite they are well mannered they are kind they own their own feelings so, so my 13 year old will say to me you know mom i've been triggered and then he'll go and he's got the skills to deal with it but he won't come to me and say you triggered me and it's all your fault and because you did this blame 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 so the way that I've raised them, uh, the other day we actually had a bride, I love the story, and they were throwing ice on the tin roof and it made such a big noise that all the adults underneath this tin roof literally just jumped up. We got such a fright. And I realized I was triggered, but I turned around and I said, boys, please don't do that. And they stopped immediately. And then I had somebody at the bride say to me, how is that possible? I thought they were being naughty. Um, and I thought that they would never listen. And how do you get your kids to listen to you? And it's this whole conscious parenting idea. We need to, again, sort out our own stuff before we can deal with our children. We have our own baggage. We have our own triggers. We discipline our children out of anger. And then we expect them to speak to us kindly when we are not speaking to them kindly. So again, it's a big shift in perspective. And yeah, so parenting is, is a big thing. But the funny thing, the one thing I've realized is, is the right parents come to me, the, the parents that are ready to hear this stuff. Um, not all parents are on this page yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm actually shaking my head because I'm, I'm not a biological parent, okay? But I, I have been involved in uh, several children's uh, upbringing, et cetera, et cetera. And I shook my head when you were saying this. I'm like, what do you mean there's no consequences? Are you mad? I mean, you know, that's that's how I grew up. If, if you do this, the consequence is X or Y or Z. And I mean, I still talk about consequences today. People need to realize their consequences to their actions. You're saying you took that all away. I'm saying it sounds like you're nuts. So how does it work? Mm. Okay, so I think this came from a place of, I started to do one-on-one -on -one coaching with a whole lot of um, adults between the ages of, from I'd say 30 and above. And there was a very common thread, because I also do life coaching. There was a very common thread in the fact that um, they were all raised very similarly. So I almost started to do my own research. And what I noticed was our generation of children were, were raised with one of two things. You were either punished for bad behavior or you were rewarded for good behavior. And what that has done is it has created a generation of adults who are so habitually trained. It's almost like we are conditioned that if we make a mistake, we have to be punished. So if nobody is punishing us, what do we do? Punish ourselves. And how do we punish ourselves? We punish ourselves mentally. If you can think of a time when you made a mistake recently, how long did it take for you to let go of that mistake and actually just see the wood for the trees and say, you know what? I made a mistake. What have I learned and how can I move forward? So our lack of self-esteem, our lack of self-worth and our confidence all comes down to the fact that we were punished for and you know the thing is um david if i have to say something we don't punish when we in a clear space we punish when we are angry we punish when we are irritated we punish when we've been triggered and what is that doing it's it's just creating another generation 
of children who are going to end up punishing themselves. You know what, you, I, I would say, and, and maybe I'm going out on a limb here, but I would say I agree with you 100%. I, I, as you were asking these questions, I was thinking, you know what, if I do something wrong to this day, my initial response, if I, if I make a mistake or I do something or whatever the case may be, is, David, you're an idiot. Now, this comes back from from my, my young days. And um, I was I was often told that I was I was an idiot and I was incapable of doing this, that and the next thing. Now, I fortunately have become aware of these kind of things, but it's still there. It doesn't go away just overnight. I mean, this is something that uh, you have to work on. And I'm thinking if, if we can get our children at a young age to start dealing with this stuff, we're going to have so many more well-adjusted parents. Um, Chemist, this yeah. is... Sorry, Sorry, carry on. I just, uh, yeah, I just want to add in something. Um, I have a very real life example with my son. Um, I believe in natural consequences. So I believe that if you don't show up, if you don't work hard, you're going to naturally have consequences. For example, um, you're going to fail or you're not going to get the, the, the marks that you want. Um, but that isn't something I'm enforcing on you. That's just a guide to, okay, what am I doing wrong and how can I do things differently and how can I do things better? Another form of a natural consequence is a child is in the bath and you keep telling them to get out the bath, but they don't want to listen. Eventually the water's going to get cold and they're going to get out. And the reality is that's a natural consequence. It's kind of like life has sorted it out for them. So up until now, I mean, my own son, if I can say, um, he had a really bad grade seven year last year and, um, he kept getting the feedback, getting the feedback, getting the feedback. And ultimately, it didn't end in the year that he wanted to. But can I tell you the lessons that he's learned? And we, as his parents, were there saying to him, we will love you no matter what. We, we never pushed him to the point of anything other than guiding him. We guided him. We guided him. We would say things like, okay, my boy, you didn't get the result you wanted. But can we just see the last week? How much time did you spend on studying that exam? for that exam and then he would see for himself and he'd say you know what i actually didn't spend anything and then what what percentage did you get okay well i got 50. well you got 50 percent without even studying can you imagine what you can get with studying and and slowly but surely they start to do their own work on themselves and again he is such a well-adjusted when people say because he's nearly 14 now when they say oh he's hit the teenagers and and um you know how 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 is he is he a difficult teenager i say he is the easiest child i've ever come across in my life and that's not just because you're a mom because (laughs) often often moms think that their children are are little angels Candice, we we, we're kind of running out of time and there's still so much i want to talk to you about um so In terms of the teachers, you do that in in groups. Um, How does that get financed? Is is that something that schools would pay for or do the teachers individually get involved? Yeah. So actually the the school, the school um, forks out the money. The the school pays for it. um, And we actually on the verge of getting our say accreditation. So as soon as we've done that, I've got a whole lot of schools that are actually waiting for me to say, yeah, um, you know, let's go because obviously they need their SACE points. Um, so that, that is, is very, very real because they do need the SACE points. But yeah, the schools definitely pay. Ultimately, I do want to get this within the, the government schools and then I'm hoping that we can get corporate funding, um, especially for the schools that can't afford it, especially when they start to see the value of this work. Another thing is like that they're taking responsibility and owning our stuff will literally change the whole of South Africa. So when the government sees this, um, yeah, my goal and my vision is to get this into literally every single school. Oh, I would agree with you. I think I think that's absolutely um, a wonderful, wonderful vision and something that is sorely needed in this yeah. country. Um, so you do you do teachers and, and, and children from what age until what age? Because you, you kind of get the littlies, then you get the tweens, which I mm. will never understand in my life. Then uh, teenagers, um, thank goodness I was never one. And then we get young adults. Do you cater to all of these guys? Absolutely, every single one of them. So with the very little ones, we teach the teachers how to do the stuff with them in the classrooms. And then we train from five years old up all the way up into young adults. Um, and, and you know, the, the teenagers, oh, it's such a, a, a valuable age because 
they, they learn skills where they suddenly see their worth and suddenly they don't need to attach themselves to unhealthy relationships and get involved with the wrong people because I believe you teach people how to treat you. And so the teenagers are actually a very, very big thing. I never thought I would enjoy them as much as what I do, but absolutely, David, we go all the way from littlies all the way up. Okay. Now, the big question is, if people want to get hold of you, maybe uh, there's, there's a teacher listening or a parent listening, and they reckon, okay, Candice is the answer to my prayers. Where do we go? How do we get in touch with you? Okay, that's awesome. So we have a website. Let me give you the website's address. So it's info, no, sorry, www.grit grow. So it's, you've got to have the hyphen in between the grit grow.co.za. I'm more than happy to give, uh, do, do you give phone numbers on these kind of shows? I don't mind you giving a phone number if you don't mind okay. people phoning you at two o'clock in the morning well. with children that are, that are misbehaving. <laughs> There's a wonderful setting called Do Not Disturb on your phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's 062 689 Wonderful. And then you can get uh, through to Candice. Uh, please do call at a respectable hour. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Candice, are you, are you part of, of the, 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 the Zabuza um, uh, platform yet? Yes, we actually only joined last week, David. Um, and I think we saw a rating of number three somewhere along the line. So we are absolutely, when we saw the platform, um, I was just super excited. And I have a business partner and he really has been amazing in running with it. Um, and now we, we do daily posts. And yes, so we only started last week, but we are absolutely a part of Zabuza. Fantastic. So people can also on the Zabuza.net platform, uh, they can find out uh, more about grit, growing resilience within. Uh, that website address again is grit-grow. Teachers call it a hyphen, I call it a dash. Uh, <laughs> grit-grow.co.za brings us uh, to the end of this particular chat. Candice, I think you're doing wonderful work and we do wish you all the best and may it go from strength to strength and may it end up in every single classroom in the country. Thank you so much for taking the time out and having a chat to us. Thank you so much, David. It was an absolute honor. And thank you for listening to me and being so open-minded. It was a treat. Wonderful stuff. There we go. It wraps it up for this edition of the Education Show. To each and every one of you out there, look after yourselves, take care, and thank you for listening. That was the Education Show. Simply learn. Join the conversation on zibuza.net. That's Z-I-B-U-Z-A dot net.